I don't read a moon poem, I will not be participating in the tradition of the Crazy Wisdom Poetry Night tonight. So, um, this is called After Reading Rex Roth, I Step Outside. And what you have to know is that I wasn't reading Rex Roth before I wrote this poem, but I, I wanted to uh, I wanted to have a title that sounded pretentious, and, um, but not too much like, like Charles Wright. Because uh, then it would be called After Reading Tofu, I Step Outside. Uh, how it illuminates the alien bodies of mushrooms colonizing the weedy lawn. They're a surprise after six weeks of near drought, delivered no doubt by the drizzle that followed. Their fibrous necks lifting up their heads so they seem to look in wonder. There was that time I went morel hunting with a woman I almost loved. We carried two plastic grocery bags and a blanket and lunch. We spent our mornings searching around the bases of birch and pine, and by the area also where fire created a richness of soil. I had thought maybe we'd find some mushrooms, eat lunch, and then make love on that blanket. The smell of moist nature, of decay and growth surrounding us, and thus that ground would be consecrated. But we were confounded to find at first the bones of what we believed to be a large animal, some ribs and vertebrae, and excited by this discovery, we dug around till we found the long femur of what was most likely a young child, a handful of metatarsals, how she drew in her breath, a slight high-pitched whistle. The flesh, of course, was gone. Who knows how long that body had rotted in the rotten earth. The police arrived inevitably. Inevitably, we had to retrace our steps back to that place, a mile from the state highway, where she had lain the blanket above the remains and held it firm with rocks, as if such a gesture might make a difference. All that first night, she wept and shivered, and there was no comfort in her, for who could sleep with milky light filling our bare windows in that way? Ed likes to, to uh, make requests, and rather than have him make it at the end of my reading, uh, this one's for Ed. It's called The Lost Love Letters of Cumberland. Um, and uh, that's the genesis of this poem, actually, a, uh, a bunch of loose-leaf love letters uh, from a high school girl to her boyfriend uh, that I found. I know she wrote them, Shonda, but don't know, can't know really whether he read them. If not, did she just misplace these folded sheets of loose-leaf, her chubby, cursive declarations of love, or did she leave them deliberately there, like square-winged moths on a bench downtown, slightly ruffling in the slight wind? There are, of course, some answers I can never know, though I try to picture Andrew's pimpled, bemused face and close-cropped hair, not knowing if this urge when he's around her to touch her is love or something baser. He's 16 after all, so why wouldn't he throw away those notes that proclaim, I want to be with you for the rest of my life until I die, I want to have your kids? I can't say. But there they were, some with a lingering patina of perfume, and I gathered them up gently, fingering each sheet so I could fold them up perfectly again, as if they had never been read, even though I had no intention of returning them. Hadn't I thrown away all the romantic notes of my youth, the ones I wrote and never sent, the ones I didn't receive? A girl I loved then committed suicide, and another was born again. And Shonda looks downward all the time and complains bitterly to her friends. I've seen her or someone just like her at the shopping mall and coffee shop. It always comes back to Andrew, who does what he always does, and who seems confused by her crying and who says to her, I love you, and hopes he means it, and who is like any of us, 
in the face of that overwhelming. station heading home. Guy on the train sang Otis Redding, used his collection plate as a tambourine. Topside snow flurries, as if the weathermen couldn't care less that the calendar calls for spring. I told myself I wouldn't write about the subways for a year, told myself I wouldn't fall in love too. Fat lot of good either did me. On the platform, Sister Taro, like a three-card Monty dealer, with her box and arcana. Oh, I chose this poem. When she sees me coming, she offers the deck. Mine are the priestess, the two of cups, and strength. For a dollar bill, she'll divine what they mean, but my budget's tight, and shouldn't she know that? Yes, I gave a buck to that hopeless crooner the way I shared one with the pregnant teen who'd once swooned for a man who left fingerprints on her neck's pale flesh. Everyone's got a sad story to tell, or else they're writing one. <coughs> Subway ads still sell valentines, all those hearts, those stupid cupids, maybe they're an omen. I've said my prayers for the future, down on my knees like a penitent, though I'm sorry for nothing, or I'm sorry for so much. Walking past her box again, those cards appear reversed, and I think that means something else. At the turnstile, I give some change to an amputee vet who thanks me and grants me a blessing for any god I choose. That's some Chinese food uh, in a poem earlier. So this, this poem's called Dim Sum. The girl in the red beret sachets among her friends on the corner of Canal Street, East Broadway. She has blonde and dark braids, and I love her exuberance at the moment, such unfettered joy with being here in Chinatown. Like a Buddha, she lives in this moment, or so it seems. It's so American, the catalog of voices ruffling among the street hawkers, the tenor squawks of taxis, the faux pagodas where we can eat, she and I, if I knew her, or even wanted us to chat. But all I want is dim sum and this opportunity to watch her dance and listen to the easy jive talk she conjures from her friends. Just this seems like a good life. At the corner, a couple kisses with such nonchalance as if, it's as if it happens, it's as if happiness had been gift wrapped solely for them. No one I see reads a newspaper, no one cries. No one mentions the war or discusses the Yankees losing again. Just this seems like divine intervention. And grateful, I place a $10 bill in the mission box a homeless friar holds out. Brother, can you? Like a pigeon, he rocks his head and bestows a blessing on me. So I give him another 10 bucks, unworthy. This is the cost to walk with one's sins, even among the city's blessed anonymity. I don't know you, but this one's for you. Um, I was I was a New York punk kid, and uh, you, you're sporting the Misfits Fiend Club shirt, so this one's for you. Oh, one by one we vanish. This is an abecedarian, which we it's an acrostic poem. Every every line starts with the next letter of the alphabet, and it's it's interspersed. I, I'm I'm reading it for this guy because it's interspersed with the names of punk bands, which helped me get some of the letters. Um, so one by one we vanish. 
Another absolute cranberry juice. Another broken evening here near the landmarks of my adolescence. Cherry Tavern, CBGB, Pyramid Club. They've all disappeared into the collective memory of aging punks. Exploited, bad brains, minor threat. Seems like forever ago. Seems like 48 hours. Whatever god I worshipped then, that girl in tight leather and high heels, or the cat who listened to my complaints, I believed they could save me from the brokerage firms and Jesuits that seemed like a permanent forecast. Kraut, the circle jerks, DOA, I listened to drum barrage, screech, and feedback, thinking maybe the Holy Spirit would fill me with distortion. Nights like that, like this, lingered without end. One by one, we vanished into our particular futures. Thus, it seems so chaotic to be back, yet familiar too. The bartender returns with a fresh drink. He looks like someone I knew those days. I recognize his laughter and that tattoo on his arm of a mohawk teddy bear. Understand. I stepped onto St. Mark's earlier, and virtually every storefront had transformed, though westward still lay Broadway, 6th Avenue, the Hudson. X, the clash, stiff little fingers, I listened to them. Yes, the songs like hymns I still remember, little zealot that I once was, little heretic. the poet at 37. Uh, I'm now 47, so uh, it's kind of dated. Um, and there's a, there's a whole line of these. There's a, the poet Larry Levis has a, a poem called The Poet at 17, and Donald Justice, his teacher, has a, a poem called The Poet at 7. So uh, it had to end with a 7, obviously. Um, and that's, that's really all you need. There was a time in my loneliness when even the streets I loved seemed like discarded candy wrappers, and whoever knew my name and called to me, I called Cretan, mostly under my breath. I was strapped the way most of us were in that city, although not destitute. I had given up on adoration and money to become the baron of my own barrenness. The what, where, who, when, I left for the bylines of crummy tabloids. For 50 cents, I read one daily for the news, but rarely read anything instructive. My fidelities were noteworthy, as were my taste in guitars, bluesy, distorted progressions with subdued melodies dancing atop of them. I loved two women then, then neither enough. This makes me typical, almost cliche. I'm sure you can guess what happened. I had been born in the county of Kings, but mostly had lived a peasant's life, riding the F train to Coney Island, or else to the dark, inchoate glamour of punk clubs, those days with their simple refrain of temptations. What does it mean that I'd stammered over all the loyalty oaths I'd ever sworn to? Darling, I tell you this not as a warning, but because despite the titles bestowed upon me, I came to scorn my own grandiosity in order to know finally that loss can be as inviting as nightfall. By habit, I walked among the lit skyline without realizing what I didn't know. My diplomas left in a closet, all I possessed was whatever unmitigated zeal I could muster after all I'd been shown. This is how I lost my luster, and lost two for that matter, and thus fell into bed each evening without surprise alone in Manhattan. I won't say I couldn't be sadder. Such melodrama was never a strength of mine. I woke up one Monday and knew I had to give up some things I believed about this world and the sublime so I might learn forgiveness sliver by sliver. Now, it's hard to recall those long weeks of my weakness, those months. The taxis passed the way they always did, the traffic on Bleecker heading east. 
I would walk to the river in the last minutes of night and watch the sky brighten in increments over Brooklyn. This is how I came to live again, walking at dawn among the city's former, former tenements, walking once more in the meager kingdom of men. There's some, some new poems uh, from a book that will be out next year called uh, The Story of Ash. This one's called Commutation. A helicopter ascended in the near distance, and interstate traffic began its trickle southward again. A slow procession past the state police and road flares waving their fiery red mittens, past the EMTs who remained on the scene, a tow truck citrus light casting a kaleidoscope into the mist. In the median, a gold sedan bent, its spine broken, and the cab of a panel van shredded into confetti as if by a giant can opener. Exposed steel rolled forward. Broken glass blended tangerine. Ahead of me, another 150 miles and a household house full of darkened windows. A woman sat among the weeds, her head turned into her spread hands while someone with authority conducted the symphony of passing cars. And crows, those smallest and darkest angels, spiraled above the highway, partisans of the destroyer god, god, the redeemer god, with their dark tongues that know the last songs, with, the dark, with their dark, dark tongues that know the resistance of flesh. I should say, this is my third reading today. <laughs> I'm so tired of my own voice. <laughs> my we uh, I, I really wish one of those crows would come right now. <laughs> uh, uh, so I'm only going to read a few more poems. And, and I, I thank you for being a gracious audience um, and, and an attentive audience. So, uh, this is On the Remains of a Fire at West End Park. Wood smoke embroidered in the incandescent air. Or is it something bigger? Another building downtown ablaze. Ghost siren wailing. Does it exist only because I long to hear it? Some new tragedy beckoning? Physics teaches us as much about religion. Physics teaches as much as religion about reality. Thus, my idol today is Schrodinger's cat. I wear its likeness on a blank medallion around my neck. In the alley, all evidence suggests a stray. The shredded bag, thin bones of yesterday's chicken strewn along the street. Another animal stricken with hunger. I reckon it could be any of us. Teens walk by, lean and slinky, nearly feline, toward the park, where swings move slightly in the wind, chains creaking, and gossip gets passed like cigarettes, and cigarettes like cheap vodka, and that bottle like laughter. There are never enough similes in this world for all our emergencies. These kids live fully in their desires and avoidances. The ones who like each other hold hands, drift off to blankets or by the monkey bars. They rub their bodies together till they become smoke. The rest remain in darkness, trying hard not to listen to anything but another story they've heard before, the past already gone, no matter how many times retold, each version slightly distorted till time reveals its inherent failings, till bored or tired or love crushed, they turn away, return the way we all have to the darkened windows of home where their parents may or may not be sleeping. They lock the door behind them as if to shut the world away, as if to question whether any of it really happened the way they remember. 
the bonfire, the rumors, the lingering sting of alcohol, even the street lamps out front setting their little nets of light. A short little poem. I've been working in this form I call the five and dime, and it's uh, ten lines in five couplets, uh, and the idea being how much can you, how much economy can you get in a poem. So uh, this is one of them. It's called this is the first one of these poems I've written actually. It's called Harrow and Sheep, um, and this is the next to the last poem I'm going to read. Pinprick of pink in the solution to ensure you struck a vein before you push the plunger in. Brief burn, then spreading numbness, a lingering, let's name it exhaustion. You've made a map of minor overdoses. You call it napping, that nodding out. I've seen it all before, syringes like the thin bones of a kitten. I've wiped the sweat, the vomit away, and for what? I wasn't a hero then. I won't be one tomorrow. I just understand hunger and all its sister urges. I understand urgency. I understand I call it love. I understand I need to. And this last poem is another uh, abecedarian. It's called Alphabet City. That's an area in New York uh, east of First Avenue between Houston Street and 14th Street, uh, where you get Avenue A, Avenue B, Avenue C. When I was a kid growing up, that's where Tompkins Square Park is. We used to call it Needle Park because of all the diabetics that hung out there. <coughs> After the ambulances left, but before the sun finally rose above Avenue C, I walked toward Tompkins Square Park where the Harrow Independent rockers slept, addled on benches, while ex-punks huddled in their leather jackets for the morning was still damp. One of them called out to me, Jerry, what was I to do when I saw her, recognized her hesitant, familiar eyes? How could I have imagined things would turn out this way when I'd call out her name, Joanna, the sleepless nights of high school, and kept a photo of her deep into college? Longing for such a sense of history, Morning was approaching in its colorful coat. Not once those months of kissing her and I wakened beside her, but oh, I wanted to. She was thinner and glanced away when I nodded. Pigeons surrounded her bench but would take off quickly with the first sudden movement or when the next squad car revealed itself in flashers and sirens. So what did I do? What could I do? The three $5 bills folded in my pocket, what use were they to me? I gave them to her, she who'd once been beautiful. How victorious I felt the first time I kissed her. We didn't look at each other, nor did we look askance. I thought of the little xyphoid syringes she might load with that money. This was my sin. Two Young black kids with dreadlocks walked by singing, Zion, take me back to Zion. And I knew I'd never be saved. Thank you.